So I don't always check my public email, but I did this morning and I found that one of y'all yassified me and it made me realize two things. One, uh, I'm even more resentful. The good Lord did not bless me with facial hair cause oh yeah. And two, Lady Philip DeFranco could absolutely get it. Look at those eyes. I want to know all her secrets. Also, when I say that out loud, do I sound a little bit like a narcissist? Yeah, but is it still true? Yes. Anyway, hi, uh, welcome to the Philip DeFranco show. Hit that like button if you want me to punch you in your throat, you weirdo. Uh, yeah, let's do the damn thing. Let's jump into it. You know, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is we had Adele pop popping up in the news because she did one of those big Oprah interviews. She talked about a lot of personal stuff. And of course, uh, the media, and I think a lot of people have just heavily focused on the weight loss aspect of the interview. Which, uh, hey, does make sense, especially because she received so much weird, in my opinion, weird backlash after losing weight over the last two years. Like, you had some people saying that she was now fat phobic, others saying that she was a hypocrite because she spoke about body positivity, and then, oh my gosh, she lost this weight. And so in this Oprah interview, the topic comes up. My body has been objectified my entire career. Mm. I'm either too big, I'm either too small, like, you know, I'm either hot or I'm either not, like, whatever. I never looked up to anyone because of their body. You know, I never admired anyone because they had the same hair colour as me or the same style as me or, you know, whatever, so... Or were the same weight as you? Never. Never, ever, ever. And when you were heavier, you were fine? I was, and I was body positive then and I'm body positive now. But it's not my job to validate how people feel about their bodies. <laughs> I love that Oprah's like, got the clip. You know, I, I think that's a really important note that she hit on, and then she continued. And I feel bad that, you know, it's made anyone feel horrible about themselves, but I, that's not my job, and I, I can't... I'm trying to sort my own life out, you know? I can't, <laughs> add, I can't add another worry and another thing to try and nail, I can't. Once again, I personally love that she's putting it out there like she's doing. Also, for the people that are going after Adele's throat here, she, she also opened up about why she started working out, saying that it wasn't even weight loss that was the goal. Saying that after she left her husband, she was having the most terrifying panic attacks and the only place she felt calm and in control was the gym. Once again, when it comes to the motive behind body positivity, I think that it should not turn into this weird thing of, glorifying unhealthy lifestyles and going, hey, whatever you look like, whatever your weight is, you are deserving of love, you are a human being. It shouldn't be this thing that's weaponized when a person makes health choices for themselves. It shouldn't become this thing where you're so tied to a celebrity like Adele that you don't feel validated or like a human anymore because she is different now. You know, when I try and look inward with a story like this and I'm trying to go like, why does this story frustrate me so much? I think it's because it, it's another example and we see plenty of them popping up these days of just the self-victimization. You have a person that made a personal choice for them. They're not like saying, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you should feel bad about this. They're doing it for them and somehow you've made it an attack on you. Like you must just be exhausting to be around. I hope that you can have some self-reflection, you can get any help that you need, but ah. Then in entertainment news, we should definitely talk about the state of online streaming. And uh, you may have seen a lot of headlines focusing on Twitch streaming specifically for women. And that in part because of a report done by Stream Elements and Rainmaker that looked at data from October of 2021 that revealed that Amaranth is by far the most watched female streamer with her content for the month being watched for over 3 million hours, which was almost double Pokimane, who was the second most watched female streamer. And so with this data, like we've seen before, a lot of people tried to make sense of it. Some people talking about is reporting on the gap between male and female streamers. And that because even with Amaranth's success, there was no women cracking the top 10 overall creators, a list entirely dominated by men. And as we've talked about before, we've had some creators try to kind of explain why this is happening. Some people saying when they watch someone, they want someone that maybe is more like them, guys watch guys. Right? So essentially saying because there are more guys that are watching, the, the creators are gonna more likely be male. But, and feel free to call me out if you think this is wrong, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I don't believe that the, the majority of people that watch Amaranth are women. Could be wrong though, I, I think the counter argument is that she's more of an outlier. Her content is more adult in nature. Uh, she's always kind of in some sort of controversy. She's riding the line. And I mean, her strategy absolutely kills. She's constantly the subject of debate. She's sometimes getting banned, but that's just getting her more promotion, both for Twitch when she comes back, but also her OnlyFans, which I imagine has to be just absolutely massive as far as an income source. But also, I mean, going back to the gap between male and female streamers, I think it's just kind of an interesting stat because I don't know really what you do about it or if you even should do something about it. Like, I think if you're a platform, you try to support all your creators equally, you're trying to, you know, diversify, get more and more people to come to your platform. But I don't think, like, some people have talked about strategies, I feel like forcing certain streamers down people's throats. But yeah, also understand, I say this as someone that's an outsider. Like, I watch some Twitch, I watch some YouTube gaming, but I, I, it's not like my main source of entertainment. So for those that are actively in it, I, I'd love to know your thoughts on this data. And then let's talk about there being so much money news in the news cycle right now. Starting with the news that for the third month in a row, consumer spending has continued to rise despite America currently experiencing its 
highest inflation rate in 30 years. And of course, recently we've talked about things getting more and more expensive, but that actually hasn't stopped Americans from spending. In fact, even when adjusted for inflation, consumer spending is higher than it was pre-pandemic. In fact, according to data published this morning from the Census Bureau, retail sales last month rose 1.7% to a new record high of $638 billion, which one, was a much higher jump than economists had predicted, and two, a lot of it came from online sales. Though not universal jumps, right? We did see some dips, notably in clothing and personal care. All of this also coming after an October jobs report showed better than expected hiring for the month, a dip in unemployment. But all of that said, there are still some fears remaining around consumer spending. For example, you had Michelle Meyer, head of US Economics at Bank of America, telling the New York Times, if the holiday shopping season is earlier and showing strength in the beginning, there could be concerns that by the end of the season, there could be a tapering of demand, especially as prices continue to increase. So obviously we're gonna have to wait to see what happens there, but also perfect segue. If you're looking to get some holiday shopping done a little early, or you just want something for yourself, the last beautiful bastard drop of the year is happening this upcoming Monday, the 22nd. It's a little earlier than I had previously scheduled. A big part of that is I just want to make sure you guys get this before Christmas. But yeah, get ready for that on Monday because there are a lot of heavily requested items and some that are incredibly limited. Starting with the Don't Be Stupid Ugly Christmas Sweater and Beanie. Also for those that hate giving up the spooky season, we have the One Day Will All Be Skeletons Ugly Christmas Sweater and Beanie. We've also got fantastic split embroidered exhausted gear, crew neck, sweatpants, shorts. Also, and you can't cancel me for this because I, I polled the ladies of the nation. I said, what is the thing that you want the most? And y'all lovely ladies almost unanimously requested the bitches be crazy, it's me, I'm bitches line. We got some crops, a flowy hoodie, options. We've also got some one day we'll all be skeletons purple goodness. We also made a whole line around that phrase. A lot of y'all seem to like good friends, bad choices. And finally, something y'all have been requesting, I think for maybe over a year, a retweak and a reimagining of the empty heart, emotionally exhausted gear. And hey, if you wanna be one of the first to know when all of this is available, make sure you follow my text line at 813-213-4423. Also, while we're talking about the holiday season, we should definitely talk about travel and specifically air travel. And that's because with the uptick for travel, you should definitely expect more of the worst kinds of behavior that we've witnessed over the past few months. In fact, I mean, over the weekend, we saw another example where there was an unruly airline passenger becoming so violent that she put a Southwest employee in the hospital. Reportedly, that situation started when the passenger, 32-year-old Ariel Jean Jackson, was boarding a Southwest flight from Dallas to New York. She allegedly heads straight to the back of the plane, but for some reason, she then gets into an argument with a flight attendant who told her that she had to get off the plane. And so she does that, but on her way out, she begins arguing with another Southwest employee who's since been identified as an operations agent. And while arguing, Jackson allegedly escalated the situation by punching that employee in the head, sending her to the hospital. Though, luckily, good news, Southwest has confirmed that the employee is in stable condition, has since been able to go home to recover. As far as Jackson, I mean, she played a stupid game and so she got stupid prizes. She was arrested on the spot and has been charged with aggravated assault. But I mean, part of the problem is this isn't even the first time a passenger has sent an airline employee to the hospital this year. Back in May, there was a woman punching a Southwest flight attendant so hard that she lost two teeth. We've also, if you've watched the show, talked a number of times about the uptick of violence in airports and on planes this year. The number is absolutely staggering. According to the data published by the FAA earlier this month. There's been over 5,100 reports of unruly passengers this year alone. With the agency having opened up 973 investigations, which is an absolutely wild number because the year before, they only opened 183. And really this story is more just a warning for you to be prepared. Especially because experts say not only do you need to possibly worry about unruly passengers, but also fully packed flights and even cancellations. With data from last week showing bookings for Thanksgiving flights already up 78% from last year. Which obviously there was a pandemic raging last year, but bookings are also even up 3% more than they were in 2019. There's a lot of excitement being around more family and friends, especially after the last two years. But there are also worries that more airlines could have operational meltdowns if there's bad weather or staff gets spread too thin. I and mean, things we've already seen with Southwest and American in recent months. On top of that, it's being reported that airports could also end up seeing shortages of TSA officers at security checkpoints, especially because as of October, around 40% of the agency's 65,000 employees had not yet reported their vaccination status, despite it being mandatory for them to be fully vaxxed by November 22nd. Though, despite the worries area of officials with the agency saying they expect the actual number of unvaxxed employees to be low. Even then, unvaccinated employees will seemingly still be able to work as long as they go through a process of vaccine education and counseling. But yeah, once again, I guess the main point of this story is just good luck to everyone traveling this year. Bad news is you may have to deal with some assholes. The good news, you may end up on the Philip DeFranco show. But from that, I wanna take a second to thank the sponsor of today's show, Movement. You know, long time viewers know that I've been a fan of Movement for years. They have tons of super stylish watches, sunglasses, bracelets, rings, and more. And Movement products have a clean, minimal design with a simple style, functionality, and affordability, starting at around $95, making Movement the perfect place to do some of that dreaded holiday shopping. Seriously, I mean, with the holidays around the corner, you can't go wrong with gifting a loved one something special for Movement. Check out these watches from their women's collection, the Sienna and the Chroma. Also, Lindsay, if you're watching, I know you're not. <laughs> 
you get enough of me at home. Uh, if you are, though, act surprised when you get these. And for the rest of you, right now, Movement is offering you beautiful bastards up to 25% off site-wide, plus free worldwide shipping and free returns when you use code PhillyD. And that sale ends on 1121. But also, if you're seeing this after the promotion, don't stress, you can still get a discount by clicking that link down below and using code PhillyD. And then we should definitely talk about Vancouver, British Columbia, now effectively on its own after being cut off from the rest of Canada due to major flooding and landslides from extreme rainfall alongside high amounts of snow melts. You've got mudslides and flooding, closing off highways. And understand, there's like no real expected time for these roads to open back up. The situation on the ground is still very dangerous. Also, beyond leaving Vancouver stranded, you have some smaller towns nearby being forced to evacuate over concerns, leading to hundreds of residents being forced from their homes. And really, I think like the only silver lining here is that at least based on preliminary reports, there doesn't appear to have been deaths yet. And obviously, we and I imagine many of us send our best wishes to those affected, but like this area has had just had to deal with so much this last year. Whereas one local professor noted on Twitter, media ask academics to give hope, and we do because there's still time to do better. But this year, 600 people in BC died in a heat wave, Lytton burned to the ground, Merritt is evacuated by flooding, and Vancouver is cut off by mudslides. At what point do we admit we're frightened? And unfortunately, it's seems like this extreme weather is only gonna get more and more common unless serious efforts are made to combat the out of control climate change. Also, speaking about freak, Weather events, we should talk about Egypt. So imagine you live in the middle of the desert and there's a massive dust storm that comes to your town. Pretty normal. Then imagine there's a lot of rainfall. Then add on top of that hail. But guess what? It's not over yet, right? All of that happened to the Egyptian city of Aswan last week, which then led to just a thing that sounds like it comes out of the Bible. All of this resulted in scorpions coming out of hiding and spreading all over town. According to local officials, more than 500 have been injured by being stung by the now homeless scorpions who were seeking shelter in people's homes. In fact, the situation got so bad that doctors who were on vacation have been recalled to help deal with the patients and administer anti venom Residents are also being asked to stay home amid this scorpion rebellion, I think that's what we'll call it. And said rebellion is being led by both the local Egyptian fat tailed scorpion and the cutely named Death Stalker. Which fun fact, uh, one of the most venomous in the world. And remember all of that, while yes, these scorpions have grabbed headlines, all of that is happening while the heavy rainfall and flooding has actually caused major damage to the city, leading to schools being forced to close, severe damage to streets, houses, and farms. And for residents of this area, it'll likely be a very long recovery as the region is known for being neglected by the Egyptian government. So yeah, uh, for 98% of you that were like, I'm having a very bad week. No, you're not. Not comparatively. At least you're not trapped at home wondering and waiting if a death stalker is waiting for you around the corner. Also, just the insanity of that sentence. It's so 2021. Also, regarding the news of COVID, vaccines, mandates, boosters, we got a bunch of other news. With Arkansas recently jumping into the mix, they became the fourth state to officially expand eligibility for the coronavirus booster shots to all adults over the age of 18. With the state now joining California, Colorado, and New Mexico in implementing new policies that go beyond the CDC's non-binding guidance. You also have the governor of West Virginia and health officials in New York City encouraging all adults 18 and older to get boosters, though stopping short of making an official policy. As far as why they're moving it now, because right, these efforts are coming just days after Pfizer officially requested for the FDA to expand eligibility to all 18 and older, it is largely because there is a fear about a winter surge. But even before people are gathering for the holidays, cases have been trending upwards in recent weeks. On Monday, new reported infections averaged 85,000 a day, a 14% increase from two weeks earlier. And at the same time in Europe, where COVID trends are often an indication for how the US is gonna be hit, a fourth wave has taken hold, driven by the unvaccinated. But at the same time, there are plenty of other states that are doing everything in their power to undermine the federal government when it comes to vaccines and mandates. With Republican leaders in more than two dozen states suing to block President Biden's vaccine mandate for companies with over 100 employees. And in fact, on November 6th, just one day after that policy took effect, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, largely considered the most conservative appellate court, blocked the mandate on large businesses. Also, just yesterday, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton filed two lawsuits against the Biden administration's mandate for healthcare workers as well as federal contractors. We also saw the Florida legislature at the request of Governor Ron DeSantis convening a special session just to take up legislation aimed at restricting not only vaccine mandates, but mask mandates. But yeah, ultimately with all of that, we're gonna have to wait and see. Uh, myself, uh, after today's show, I'm gonna go get my booster. Also, separate from the vaccine, we had Pfizer announcing this morning that it's agreed to a licensing sharing deal that will allow other manufacturers around the world to make and sell its experimental pill to treat COVID-19. Right, and so for those that missed it, earlier this month, Pfizer reported the fantastic news that clinical trials of the pill found that the antiviral reduces the risk of hospitalization and death by 89% in high-risk adults who receive the drug within three days of contracting the virus. Now, notably, before you just try and pop some shit into your mouth, the pill has not received regulatory approval in the US, but actually just this afternoon, we got the news that the company has submitted its application for emergency authorization from the FDA. And very notably, in a statement today, Pfizer said that it would grant a license for the antiviral pill to the UN-backed medicines patent pool, which is huge because it will allow drug makers to make and sell the drug inexpensively in 95 developing countries that compose of more than half the world's population, which is also a deal very similar to another agreement made last month with the pharmaceutical company Merck for its COVID pill to be produced and sold at 
cheap rates in 105 countries. And as places like NPR have explained, effective COVID-19 pills are seen as potential game changers in the pandemic because they could be administered at home early after an infection, reducing both the coronavirus's toll and the potential for a single patient to spread it. But also while this seems incredibly positive, there are many public health officials saying these efforts do not go far enough. Noting that both the Pfizer and Merck deals leave out many poor countries that have been hit hard by COVID. But according to reports, Brazil, which has one of the worst pandemic death tolls in the world, is left out of both deals. Also, while many Latin American nations are a part of the deal, many populous countries like Argentina and Mexico were also left out. So as a result, it said that these nations will then have to purchase the drugs directly from Pfizer, likely at higher prices, and that's even if there are supplies left. But with all that said, if the data is correct, I see this as an overwhelming net positive. But at the same time, I wonder if these pills will also get politicized. So while I know there aren't a ton of people that, that watch me that are, say no to the vaccine, I know some of you, th that's the case. I would like to ask you, do you view these pills in a different light than the vaccine? If so, why? I mean, as I mentioned yesterday, I can't protect anyone in the comments, but I would ask, let's try and have a civil conversation about this one thing at least. Yeah, I'd love to know. But ultimately that is where that story and today's show ends. Of course, with this last one, the first one, anything in between, I'd love to know your thoughts on today's stories in those comments down below. With that said, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.